Okay, folks, I'll, I'll, I'll kick the, the meeting off. You'll not hear much from me, but just uh, introduce people in the room, people online. So this is a, a hybrid meeting or whatever you would call it. So welcome to all. This is a, 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 one of our monthly ORF meetings. So brought to you by ORF. Uh, and uh, we, we have these every month and run through the year. Uh, we plug, if anybody isn't a member of ORF, we'd be very happy to have you as members of ORF. It's not hard to do. There's an online application form on our website, so please feel free to, to, to do that and, and get involved in what we're doing as ORF. So uh, as, as ORF, we, 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 it's the Renewable Energy Forum, so we concentrate on, on, on renewable energy and more and more on sustainability as part of that whole process, which is obviously where a lot of the projects that all the companies are working on goes to. So one of the things we've always wanted to do is get a bit closer to the farming community in Orkney, and we've done that a number of times. We had a talk uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, a bit of work on uh, seaweed and farming and, and how that uh, and, and that mix and how that might mix with energy. But tonight we're going, at, we're going another loop and, and, and we're going to be looking at vertical farming. And I'm just going to introduce Derek Stewart from the, from the, the Hutton Institute, a, a Professor Derek Stewart, who is going to take us through a bit of the background and a bit of where, where he sees vertical farming going. It is very relevant to Orkney. It's, it, it, there's been a little bit of work done in Orkney and there's more work to be done in Orkney, uh, I, I think around the, with the, a, 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 a net, what is it, the Island Centre for Net Zero, which is the sort of next next phase so we're linked with other items it's not quite ready to be presented yet but, but, but this is the initial work so it's great to to have a, a professor stewart here to, to give us an introduction so without more ado i'll pass over to you uh, derek if you want to take the screen and take us through that and hopefully we'll have a chance at the end then to come back and and and, and, and ask some questions so over to you Thanks everyone. I'll start sharing my screen and get into the talk. That's what you're here to see and hear. Um, can you give me a thumbs up just to check you're seeing everything? Cool. Okay, right. So I'm going to talk about opportunities in vertical farming. Um, and what you're seeing in front of you there is a new building we will have for the Advanced Plant Growth Centre. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Again, this is from Regional Development Deals, which I'm sure you're all familiar with since you guys have a, an Islands Development Deal. So let's start with the bigger picture. Populations are going to be increasing globally. I'll contextualize this for you guys later on, but we tend to work on big picture stuff. Um, so populations predicted to hit 8.3 billion by 2030. We need to feed these people. So that's 50% more food on a limited footprint of land. So this needs more land, but we can't create more land. We're currently trashing land at a phenomenal rate through soil erosion and given biodiversity loss. And of course, with that, there's fresh water and energy demands to produce that food. Now, there's an interesting statistic here that uh, I picked up the other day. In the next 40 years, we'll have to produce more food globally than we produced in the last 10,000 years. You can wrap your head around that figure. So in the next 40 years, we need to produce more food than we have in the last 10,000 years because of the population increase. So the scale of the problem is in front of us there. And of course, producing food currently has some problems. So you've got the geopolitical situation where Ukraine, uh, particularly through grain and other things and oil, they provide calories to feed about half a billion people globally. Brexit's caused its own problems with regard to imports and exports with associated price rises for imports. Um, energy, of course, and we'll come back to this time and time again, uh, is a big driver and impactor on the food and drink industry. Um, so it affects 60% of those in the industry compared to 38% across other sectors. So food is particularly sensitive to energy increases. And of course, the food system globally is the bad guy, or is pegged as the bad guy with regard to greenhouse gas emissions, being attributed to produce anything between 20 to 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So clearly, we cannot carry on as we have done. So we'll go back and do a wee bit of history. Clearly, pre industrializations we were fairly food secure. Can you see my mouse swinging around? Yeah, yeah. yeah cool, that's fine. So, 
up to close to Victorian times, we were fairly food sufficient. And then as we started to make the rest of the world pink on the map, we started to import, quote, take food from them and bring it back. So our su food sufficiency or security diminished. So we were just importing everything or demanding and taking, to be honest. Um, so following the World Wars, we kind of flipped that and went for a big drive, actually as part of the Second World War, and went for an increase in food security. And that's sustained for a while, but we're diminishing now fairly rapidly. And we're probably now down to a food security level, self-sufficiency of arguably anything between 55 to 60 odd percent. Now, some people would say that's enough. Certainly um, aspects of government think that may be enough. Um, but with the geopolitical situation going on and so on and Brexit, I think we probably want to lift that level a bit more. So what about the Scottish figures? Well, if you look at the total income from farming, uh, this is this is the latest data, bizarrely. It's only 2018, and it was up from Scottish Agriculture 2019, from Scottish Government. The income from things like cereals, crops, and horticulture uh, was realistically quite low on that level. It was only just over a billion, which is certainly not enough to satisfy the Scottish population in terms of food. If we then break that down again in terms of segmentation and where uh, the manufacturing split went, from uh, food, a uh, crop, specifically crop-based stuff, there's not a huge amount. Well, beverages, obviously, barley is going into whiskey. That's a huge driver there. But for things like fruit and vegetables and bakery products, it's 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 no great shakes on the overall breakdown of uh, Scottish food processing production. So again, we're importing a lot to satisfy that demand. And again, if we look at um, so here we've got UK imports and exports of food, feed, and drink. Um, so if you look to see who we're exporting to, there's, there's not really many big numbers, and this is in billions of pounds. But if you look at the import side, you can see but just by comparing them both, we've got a huge disparity between imports and exports. We're importing way more than we're exporting. So we're, we've got a large import deficit with regard to uh, food, drink, and feed, which clearly is a balance of payments thing, isn't particularly smart. Um, if you spin it a different way, there was a study by the property group called Savills who looked at, they were looking at, um, well, this was actually controlled environment agriculture they were, they were looking at here, but also looking at the impacts of things like company, uh, countries that were running at high water risk, meaning um, they don't have very much water and they're getting tapped out. So if you look at, as the color, all the uh, red to yellow countries are countries where we're importing significant amounts of fruit and veg from, but actually they're becoming quite dry countries and that supply will, will end soonish. Spain in particular is accelerating the rate at which it can no longer be able to sustain growing crops for export because they're simply running out of water. Um, what I would argue, and hopefully you'll see later on, is the development of technologies like controlled environment agriculture. And for some of the, these fruit and veg, um, vertical farming means we can probably sustain production ourselves transform that balance of payments, create local jobs in the local economy. Um, so similarly, on the same type of thing, if you look at water impact on the bottom and land impact on the, on the, the left hand scale, the higher number you've got, the better you are at dealing with water management and land impact. So you can see countries like UK, Canada, Netherlands, Denmark are not too bad. But again, as I said before, we import a lot from Spain, so they're kind of not too bad on their land, trashing it a wee bit, but the, uh, the land impact's really problematic, and their water impact is starting to go down the scale. So they're going to hit real problems, which means the knock-on effect on our food and, food and vegetable supply chain is going to be quite significant in 10 to 20 years. So Earlier on, a few people have mentioned the words of sustainability. If you do one of these fancy word cloud things and throw sustainability in and get uh, the, the phrases that are often associated with sustainability, you rarely ever see food. Food and sustainability rarely ever comes into that. And my think, thinking behind that is probably because food is ubiquitous and doesn't really come into it. So sustainability all tends to be around energy, consumption, climate change, but food is so fundamental and it's going to be feeding an ever-growing population. You have to think about sustainability there as well. 
So work I was doing with the Scottish Wholesale Association, so they're basically the people that are transporting stuff from A to B and buying stuff in bulk and then taking it to retailers, um, discussing with them what they thought factors impacting on sustainability were. And key to this is primary and secondary processing where cost is a huge implication for primary production. And cost generally means can be translated back to energy. So fertilizer means energy. Diesel means energy. Labor means human energy and cost. And in secondary processing, energy is a major contributing factor. So energy across those two pieces are huge and actually impact on cost all the way through this chain. And the other parts of the chain have got their own aspects. The consumer doesn't really think about energy. They're more interested in things like taste, shelf life, freshness, and so on. But by changing the processes there, we still have to satisfy all these components there as well. And also, if you're, if you're a processor, uh, and as things are going forward, I don't know how, many, how much any of you know about uh, looking at calculating greenhouse gas emissions and companies reporting on these. Basically, scope one emissions are ones that are created directly by you. You can calculate them based on your inputs and outputs. But the hardest part is scope three emissions. These are the ones that are coming from um, upstream activities. So if that's a food processor, the upstream activities would be primary production. Um, so what we're talking about is certainly for vertical farming, we can easily calculate all of these scope three emissions that would go into food processing companies. Or actually, if you're just processing, uh, making crops to sell as food, you really only have predominantly scope one emissions and your scope three would be uh, other aspects coming in like materials for the building so on. So vertical farming, hopefully you'll see later on, will become easier to calculate emissions. And we will all have to do that going forward. Anyway, let's cut to the chase on vertical farming. So I did this slide a long time ago and talking about the history of horticulture and controlled agriculture. But actually, there's a step before that, a kind of anecdotal history step. If you go back to just in the early AD times, it was about 10, 20 AD, um, there was a Caesar who was ill in Rome, and he went to one of the coasts in Italy, but he had a real uh, fondness for cucumbers, but he wanted cucumbers out of season. So he got his lead scientists of the day to design a controlled environment system that would allow him to grow cucumbers out of season. So basically, they created linen-based, not really glass houses, but more like cloches, um, that let some of the sunlight through and was able to control the temperature. So that's probably the start of controlled environment agriculture. If we race forward to Victorian times, that's when we saw the real uplift in things like glass houses, particularly with designs like this. That was the incident, uh, the, the increase or the start of things like mechanization, water power and steam power. And to be brutally honest, large elements of um, horticulture still exist under that today. However, you'll see, I don't know if you've seen on the news, but certainly down in England, a large amount of glasshouse companies are closing down because they can't afford to generate the steam that, that feeds their heating systems. So they can't afford the gas to heat the heating systems because the cost to produce is way beyond anything they can recoup in productivity. So following on from that old traditional one, which as I say, in some cases is still there, we started to adopt a much more mechanized mass production where you saw these acreages of glass houses and they, they had a, a, a mechanization and assembly line system kind of built into them. But what we've moved, do, moved on to now is computerized and automated glass houses uh, where they've got sensors built into them. And what we're starting to evolve them in is to basically internet of things, glass houses. So basically everything can be, I can control it sitting here I can control vertical farms and glass houses here, and they may be based in Siberia, Florida, California, Tasmania. So it's the, inter the connectivity of these systems is allowing much greater control uh, for many things and allow data reporting back. That, that doesn't necessarily aid the people that are running it, but it allows, if there's technology in there, th that technology the often feeds back to the manufacturer and can tell them if something's going wrong, but it also allows them to collect um, large-scale data to better design future products. Or if you've got a really big manufacturing system worldwide, you can connect them all up and really define what your global supply chain is. 
So a modern day state of the art glass house is not just a bit of glass at the bottom of the garden anymore. So what they've got is they'll tend to be, most of them now are trying to get alternative power sources. So they may be uh, linking into things like ground heat pumps, AD systems, solar farms, um, wind turbine if they've got them, and a myriad of other alternative uh, systems. They, they tend to be, excuse me, well linked up to um, various sensors for uh, temperature, humidity, um, and what we're increasingly seeing is sensors going in there to indicate early indicators of stress. So it could be nutrient stress or something wrong with the feeding system, the watering system, and so on. All of these things are in state-of-the-art glass houses, but they've now been adopted and put into vertical farming systems. So we've taken a lot of that on board, and as part of these regional development deals, there's one here called the Advanced Plant Growth Centre. Um, that's the one in which we've got vertical farming going on. I'll tell you much more about that now. And of course, we're helping with the, the islands deal because there's a plan there to potentially have a vertical farm uh, as part of one of the projects funded through that. So our money is going on to building a nice laboratory system, but also vertical farming systems as well. And as part of the advanced plant growth system, the aim is fairly clear on the vision. So it's next generation controlled pre and post harvest environments. So that means controlled environment growing conditions and storing conditions, because we don't eat everything we grow immediately. We have to store it and use it to uh, feed us over a longer period. And what developments and technologies in all these areas will allow us to do is develop new processes, solutions, uh, mechanizations, uh, intellectual property and crop varieties for the next generation to ensure uh, food security or material security is there. So within the Advanced Plant Growth Center, we've got four different aspects. Now, I'm only going to concentrate today on vertical growth power. If anyone wants further information on this, please just give me a shout. Mike's, Mike's got my email. I'm happy that's circulated to everyone. But I'll, um, I'll circulate this talk as a PDF anyway. But I think Mike, you're recording it and people can see it. My email's at the start. So vertical farming, what does it do? Well, there's, there's, here's different examples of vertical farms, and I'll show you some more in a minute. It's basically stacked growing. It's taking outside, bringing it inside, and just putting it into layers like that. What it allows you to do is uh, it takes, uh, instead of sunlight, it uses very controlled LED lighting, which means you can control the full spectrum of light a plant gets. And so what that means is you can really tweak the lighting to exactly what the plant wants. Same thing with what it eats in terms of nutrition, the humidity and the temperature. So every day in the vertical farm should be the birthday day for a plant. It's sitting there loving it, sitting back, hands back like that, pina colada equivalent, loving it, really enjoying it, growing to its best effect. What you can also do is put a high level of carbon dioxide in there because plants eat CO2. So if you co-located your vertical farm next to, say for example, a distillery or a brewery, they've got really clean CO2 that they produce through fermentation. You would pump that into the vertical farm, and what you're doing is feeding the plant extra. So you can take the CO2 level to three, four times the ambient level, and the plant just loves it, and it just beefs out, if you pardon the ironic comparator, beefs out and really puts biomass off quite significantly. Well, what would you grow in one of these? Well, you're limited by your own imagination. It's probably a waste of time growing things like wheat, oats, barley, potatoes, they should be able to grow outside, although you have some challenging conditions, I know that. But what you would use them for is you can grow all manner of smaller horticultural crops, like uh, any most of the small soft fruits, the salad crops, the herbs. Um, we've actually had things like dwarf rice growing. Uh, we can, but you can also produce, use it to produce things that are growing outside as well. So um, it's a phenomenal system for growing things like seed potato. So we did it, and it was so successful in seed potato, it buckled one of the trees we had. It put so much biomass on, we weren't expecting it to be as successful as it was, but it was spectacularly successful. So you can then take these seed potatoes, put the tatties outside, grow them there. Similarly, you can grow plantlets that can then be taken out and grown in the polycrub system across the island. So strawberry plantlets is a good one for that because they're quite expensive. They're generally imported either from south of England or the Netherlands. And if they're from the Netherlands, they say they're disease-free. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. 
Um, or you can actually use, use the systems to grow something very different. So um, I know certainly in the islands, there's a large tourism impact. And so can you use them to grow something that would impact on that? Well, you can. So you can grow highly colored plants to give you sustainable colors that can go into cosmetics. So if you had a business that was producing oils, soaps, uh, lipsticks even on island, the colors can be grown in a vertical farm and put into your cosmetics. So what you're producing in that area on a per kilogram basis is much more valuable than the food because your product at the end is much more expensive. Or you can do what we're also doing is looking to use the systems to grow pharmaceuticals, whether it's CBD, whether it's morphine, all of these things come from plant systems that can be grown very contained within those systems. So at its base level, a vertical farm, and this is best to described by partners of ours who are based on the Dundee site, Intelligent Growth Solutions. If you take a field and cut it up into, in their system, snooker-sized trays, and then stack them one on each other, and you can see the picture down at the bottom here, you can see the trays all stacked one on top of each other with the lights underneath each tray for growing the system below. And then you put them in the box. Now they've got an equivalent as the shed. It looks like a shed that an as the um, shops in. And basically you create this uh, tiered system in there and in, in the middle of it, and you can just see faintly that line going up and down. That's, that's a huge motorcycle belt that's driving a lift. So the system can come down, take a tree out, bring the tree down and bring it out to you. So actually it's taking humans out of the growing system because humans invariably come with problems with plants, either to take disease in or they, they, they just can't fail to tinker and make mistakes. So the, the less humans are in there, the more controlled and the more um, higher quality the crops are. So what you grow today will be the same 10 years down the line if you leave the system alone. What we found as well is the productivity of um, vertical farms is probably 100 times to 120 times more productive than open field growing. Um, but more of that later. So. What does it allow you to do? Well, you, you've got dynamic lighting, and here's a good example of one. We Liberty Produce, one of our colleagues. So there's the LED strips along here. They produce enough to allow you to produce really luscious, significant plants. Now here we've got, um, this is some sort of lettuce. That's basil, that's chives. I'm not quite sure what the purple one is. Um, I should have really looked before I did that. But what the vertical farm allows you to do is have closed loop systems. So the water that goes into these things, you, you cycle it and clean it. So the amount of water you use uh, is reduced dramatically. That's not the biggest selling argument in Scotland. We've got to be honest about that. And actually, given the weather you've had today, me talking about water efficiency is probably I'm banging my head against the brick wall on that one, I understand. But what, what you can also do is, um, because you've got the water cycling, the plant doesn't suck all the nutrition up at once. So you've often got nutrition left. So all you're doing is topping up. Whereas in field farming, you're often just putting fertilizer out there and it doesn't always get used by a long extent and you get runoff. You can't get runoff in these systems because you're continually using it. And again, you control everything. So ultimately what you tend to do is create recipes that are temperature, humidity, um, and when the lights go on and off and what wavelength of light you use. Because the LEDs can be blue, green, red, far red, sometimes UV as well. So you can really manipulate the plants to a phenomenal degree. So how does it work? Um, well, plants, if you, if you think about a plant growing outside, the sun tends to go like this, sweeps around. And now at every stage of where the sun is, the quality of light is different. So the plants have become accustomed and co-evolved to a system that at the start of the day, I'm expecting this light, at midpoint of the day, I'm expecting that light and towards the end this. And of course, that will change as the season goes on as well. So height of summer will be different quality of light to at midday to September, for example. Um, and so you've got a whole series of variations in light, but we can program all of that in, in the vertical farm. So what happens if you play with it? So here we have a, a herb here where we played around with a mix of light. So we're having a 50-50 blue and red. 25, 75, blue and red, and then flipping it the other way. Now, in appearance wise, you can see you can completely play around with the appearance of the crop, but this also has significant impacts on the taste. And similarly, we've done stuff with um, growing strawberries. If we play around with the light, 
and enrich different aspects of the light. So you've got your control light. If we add more blue, you get a wee bit more anthocyanins, and they're the red color in a strawberry. If you add a bit more red light, you get a lot more anthocyanins. And if you get far red light, that really wraps it up. And the strawberries you get from that are unbelievably red, deep blood red. In fact, the far red, they were unattractively red. The red was too deep. Um, and what it also impacts on then is the antioxidants. So people are consuming foods because they think they're healthy, they've got antioxidants. You can see if you put far red in, lovely red plants, but the antioxidant level is not as good as when you give them red light. So again, we, we need to tweak and measure everything and assess the chemical structure and the chemical composition of what's coming out of there. So what kind of vertical farm do you want? Well, there's a million and one to pick from, to be brutally honest. Bearing in mind, they all have to be powered. The light has to have energy from somewhere. So they may all look very different. And actually, some of them look, can look really rudimentary. So a good example is the one in the middle. Now, that one you can see where my mic's circulating on. I reckon I can knock that one up from stuff from B&Q or a local uh, hardware store, because all it is, is is plastic pipes. You can drill them out, put plug, plant plugs in, and as long as you've got a circulating water system, now in this one, it would circulate like that, and clear, clarify, purify the water, add more nutrients, and then it's back up again. So you can make them as simple or as complex as you want, depending on what scale you want to grow at and what you want to grow in them. The larger scale you go, and say, for example, you're producing salad vegetable from Walmart in the States, I don't think you're going to go for that system. That system is the one you're going to go for because it's big scale and productive. One of the other ones on a more community-based system that's, that's going ahead at the moment, a lot of them are uh, containerized-based systems. So Liberty Produce, actually, I'll go back one. Sorry. Liberty Produce, which is that one, that's a container-based system. There are other variations of that that are pretty similar. Again, you can see it says racking, plastic piping, and lights. This one, they've got strip lights. I'm not convinced that's going to be that effective. That's cubic farms. And this one, square roots, they're very much LED driven. They're producing a high quality product at the moment. And they produce theirs as a modular system. So if you want to grow more, you can buy another block. They're kind of described as a sort of Lego version of vertical farming. You just keep adding on more as you want to play with it. And there's companies in South of the UK called Let Us Grow. They've got a kind of similar one where you've got an ante room to prepare the plants and then you can grow them, or you add another uh, container on where you can grow the plants. And again, it's depending on how complex or large an opportunity you want, how complex your system is. The bigger the system becomes, the more you want to start bringing in automation. And this automation means getting robots in. And by robots, that sounds like a really fancy term. It's not, it's just a, a small mobile system that often lifts the trays, takes them to something and something else is done. That something else can be robotic harvesters. It could be robotic planters. Um, it could be cutters. So some of the crops like dill, they'll continually grow. So you might just want to cut them and harvest that and then put it back in. Some of the other plants you might want to take out, cut, and then that waste goes for something else. And then you take that harvested crop, whether it's, basil, coriander, lettuce, whatever you want, then that can be bagged and sealed. All of that can be done without humans. So a vertical farm system is one where you rarely if ever see plant disease uh, or any types of disease because it's a clean system. So because it's a clean system, you don't have to wash the produce. So if you're not, not washing it, there's none of that sort of liquid at the bottom. So I'm sure you'll have gone to the local shops, you buy a bag of salad, you have half of it maybe, put it in the fridge, you take it out the next day, and there's that horrible brown gunk sitting at the bottom. You think, oh, I really don't fancy that bin. Uh, salad bag vegetables is the biggest single waste product in the UK per unit. Um, but if you don't have to wash it, you don't get that horrible gunk at the bottom. But, and because you don't wash it, the plant isn't stressed. And it means you usually extend the shelf life by a week, week and a half. So that this production system gives multiple wins along, along the way. You can design any vertical farm you want. You're limited by only by your imagination. So this one in the middle is an interesting one where they've got, um, they've got tilapia fish at the bottom. And they're taking the tilapia 
water that's constantly circulated. They take that out, and because of the fish poo, that's processed. There's so they filter out the solids, and you've got micro microbiologically checked, of course, but it's got lots of soluble nutrients, so you don't have to add any other nutrients to feed the crops you're then growing under the vertical farming systems above it. Now, the lights from them, you can see them there. So that concept's being developed, and there's a model one in the Netherlands, I think, where they've got, um, instead of fish, it's cows they have. So they're processing cow manure, filtering it, taking the nutrients from that, and feeding that back into a vertical farm to try and create a full circular economy aspect, uh, circular economy model for crop and livestock production. I'm not convinced that one's going to work that well because the human diseases are far too transmissible in uh, livestock and there's too much of a crossover there. But the fish one actually gains some credence for low grade or low design vertical farms. There are some wild and wacky ones when you've got vertical, this is a huge building design here, vertical farms here, plant prep systems. Um, they're even thinking about growing trees in vertical farms there uh, with restaurants on the top. These are all just concept designs. But you might start to see them coming into things like, I don't know if anyone's aware of that development that's going on in Saudi Arabia called Neom. It's a 170 kilometer city. It's just one long building, essentially. Well, they're probably going to put things like that in it to produce food in that area, fueled by solar power. Or you've got the really classic German design here. This is a design for a potential vertical farm in central Berlin, um, where they're and you can see the scale from, you know, you know the size of one of those uh, cranes, so that gives you a feel for the scale here. So you've got different plant development vertical farm systems in there, but on the roof they've got a greenhouse as well for larger crops. Um, what's less convincing in that one is how they would fuel it, because if you're in a city accessing renewable energy, it's kind of difficult. I know you can pull energy out of the sewer system, but not enough to power that. So we'll see what happens with that one. But what it's shown, I think, in the existing food system is that with climate change, we need to change things throughout the system. So traditional agriculture, we grow it, it's harvested, and then it's shipped for packaging, and then it's shipped for distribution, and it's shipped for retail, and then you've got different bits in there in storage and transportation. Vertical farming allows you to move the growing right to the distribution center. So you can kind of cut out a lot of that. Well, certainly the lorry piece in there can be cut out. Absolutely. Or if you've got a vertical farm, you can put them in the middle of a city. So I'm discussing things with a, a company in Dundee at the moment to put a vertical farm in a huge basement in an old jute mill in Dundee. So they would supply retail within a, I don't know, five, 10 mile radius. It would satisfy that really easily. But we've got to square the energy circle to, to make that one work. So going back to that energy and sustainability piece, if you compare outdoor greenhouse and uh, indoor, here kind of vertical farming we're talking about, the major contributor to things like outdoor ag is labour. Well, that's a real problem in UK agriculture at the moment. A, we can't get the UK uh, people to work on land. Um, we've now developed uh, a system through Brexit that means we can't get people in coming over seasonally to pick which is kind of screwing things up there. Um, so that might, you'll see that diminish or change quite significantly into mechanized crops or outdoor. If you grow things in greenhouse, labor's still there, but you're actually starting to see mechanization and robotization coming in significantly. Similarly with vertical farming, but both of them you're starting to see that the utilities or energy costs are the big thing. So that then impacts on sustainability and emissions profiles. So if you've got a conventional vertical farm, and we, we've got a paper that's just coming out soon, we've done a study on this with uh, multiple different systems. If you're on a conventional vertical farm by plugging it into the wall or a coal-fired economy, it is absolutely not sustainable because of the level of lights you've got in there. It ain't, well, comparatively, it's less sustainable. Um, conventional greenhouse, they're obviously using the sun some of the time, but the more northerly you go, you're adding supplemental lighting, it becomes less sustainable or more greenhouse gas emitting. Open field ag still wins, uh, comparing these three, but you've got diesel, you've got uh, fertilizer energy costs and so on, which are not recycled. But if you then look at, um, if you supply a vertical farm with renewable energy, 
So renewable energy like wind, wave, hydro, whatever, the sustainability of the produce goes way down. Okay, so the, the, the fossil fuel use from gas that these things tend to use or that one would use is eliminated. Um, so the footprint goes way down. Regardless of what system you use, the productivity of vertical farming goes way beyond anything you can imagine. So, for example, if you look at the yield of crop per kilo, so how much the crop yield per so kilograms per meter squared per year. Um, if you're growing an open field, and this is once for lettuce, we've done it for other ones, you could probably go about four kilograms per meter squared a year. Glass house is about 10 times that. Vertical farms, it's up to 120 times that. So the productivity for that footprint is absolutely enormous. But also, if you look at things, as I say, we're working with partners in Singapore and the Middle East, water use is a problem for them. Um, vertical farming is the most, it's, it's the uber water efficiency system. And similarly for nutrients, it's much more nutrient efficient than glass houses or open fields. And again, it's that whole issue of food security coming in. You can put the vertical farm near the area that needs the food or the product that's coming out of it. Doesn't have to be food, obviously. So there's many wins on an economic, environmental and social level can come into this. And you can't, it's hard to bat one against the other, to be honest. It depends on what you're using the farm for. So who wants this? Well, we chatted to a lot of these companies. This is a slide from Oxfam, actually. And I think it was basically, who, who controls the world of food? All of the big companies are really interested in vertical farming for the reason that if they produce a product or a crop that goes into their products, they can guarantee that the quality of that crop is the same any place in the world if it's grown in a vertical farm. So if you're producing uh, a Nestle product that's using basil going into the process or it's peppermint is going into it, they know that that peppermint, even if it's sourced in Johannesburg, Orkney, uh, Saskatchewan, Rio de Janeiro, if you're using the vertical farm system with the same recipe of light and genetics, the quality will be identical. So they love that because generally most companies don't mind a diminished quality. What they don't want is variation because that variation is very quickly picked up on by the consumer. So they're all investing into that as are their subsidiary companies all around here. Now, food isn't the only thing you can grow. So at the minute we've got several cannabis uh, projects looking at controlled environment with an eye on the CBD market. Um, but also THC, the recreational one, is also used in a pharma pharmaceutical market. And I think cannabis is going to be heavily regulated going forward with pharmaceuticals companies coming in. And what they will want is secure supply systems and, and ones that will deliver high quality. Uh, vertical farming is perfect for this. And in fact, we're discussing with a colleague of mine in industry about building a specific cannabis vertical farm in Scotland. That's probably going to happen quite soon. Um, and I think he will pr probably produce the highest grade, excuse me, and most productive cannabis globally using that system. But there's other things you can grow. So um, if any of you are unfortunate enough to have someone in the family who's got Alzheimer's and are getting treatment for it, what they're probably getting is galantamine. Now that's a, this is that complex molecule and that's pulled from snowdrops and daffodil bulbs. Now they grow them outside your slide, but they're susceptible to weather, uh, pests and pathogens, which means productivity is variable year on year. Climate change is causing real problems on productivity as well. So they will probably shift wholeheartedly into controlled environment as well. And of course, there's the, there's the king of all pain relief morphine. At the minute, that's grown uh, through poppies that are growing in Tasmania, Iraq or Iran. One's 13,000 miles away and the other one's kind of geopolitically not the most stable place in the world at the moment. So you come, uh, countries are starting to think about producing these, these crops internally, next, actually next to the processing facilities. So what companies do is they'll ship the, um, they'll ship the poppies processed thousands of miles around the world and process it so they can then produce the morphine. What you can do is grow it next to the facility. And that model works for other things like the cosmetics, uh, sustainable color crops and so on. So is there much money in vertical farming? Well, yeah, kind of. It's, it's currently running at about 3 billion in 2021. Uh, these are old figures. It's now projected to be about 29 billion by 2029. 
you always take a lot of this by a, with a pinch of salt because no, no one ever predicts a downturn in markets. But having worked in this area, I can see that actually those predictions are all on the money. And a lot of these systems are going to win big significantly. And you'll start to see a lot of the food in your supply chain that's crop-based produced through these systems. So it's not just the global industries of producing the food that are interested. So you've got markets here, as I said, just now it's about 4 billion for vertical farming. It'll go up to about 30 in about a decade. But there's lots of other industries associated with it that have become interested. So there's the lighting, sensors, the fresh produce market's huge, 100 billion globally. But generally agriculture is switching onto this because the way we use land and produce food is changing. And agriculture as an industry is 4% of global GDP. That ain't small beer. And to see them pivot towards that is interesting. Then you get the other sides of things. So the insurance companies, and I think they'd admit it themselves, they don't like paying out. So they want systems that are de-risked. Now, if you're growing something outside, you've got a wee bit of wind and rain up there. Compare that to what the crop you would get if you grew the same crop inside in a controlled environment. You could almost 99.99% guarantee it will grow indoors. Outdoors, not so much. So insurance companies are really interested in investing in vertical farming now because they see that as a way to de-risk payments and paying out. They see it as a secure investment. Similarly, all these vertical farms are producing lots and lots of data, and that data is then being used for large companies that want to vertical farm or use agriculture to allow predictive agriculture so they can predict. If you've got a vertical farm, you can predict what you're growing for the next 10 years, almost to the kilogram. So the data on that is, is monetizable, as is the analytics, the software systems they used to calculate that. And of course, then you've got the whole energy piece, which is at the minute, it's probably 3 billion associated with those systems. That's just going to go up because it starts to encompass multiple different energy systems and usage. And as I said, pharmaceuticals becoming interested. And then the one that's an interesting one at the end is what we can also grow are crops that are we want to put back into the environment, but there aren't enough of them. So we can rewild. These can be factories to produce crops we want to rewild. One of the interesting bits I uh, was helping one of the vertical farm companies with is growing trees, small trees, up to, up to about half a metre, the tree plantlets in a vertical farm. And was that a better way to do it than growing them in nurseries at the minute? Uh, absolutely 100% better. So the, the germination rate was 99.9%. We had almost zero losses in crops and the hardiness was fantastic. So everything that was then planted out took off and grew. So to the extent that we're, we're seeing one of, the, um, one of the Scottish forestry associated associations and industries it's probably going to buy a vertical farm specifically to create plantlets for rewilding trees outside. And actually, we tried it for all the coniferous and deciduous trees. Nothing failed. The, the, the trees absolutely loved it. What we then do is give them a wee shock near the end to harden them up, get them used to the bad outside world. But when you put them out there, they grow like billy -o. So some of the other interesting things we're doing, and this might be an interesting one from a tourism perspective up in Orkney. Working with a big international company called the Fermi Group, they're building spas all over the world. And they, what they're going to do is put a vertical farm in their spa to produce the range of healthy foods you would normally get in a spa. So when you're in there eating, you, you've been in the gym for an hour, you've come out feeling suitably smug, and you think, right, I'm going to have a healthy salad now. You'll see from a glass wall, probably, occasionally, what you're eating can be growing within a vertical farm there. But the, the vertical farm for the spas will also be growing ingredients into their oils and emollients and their shampoos as well. So they, they, they've thought this through well, and that system's developing quite fast now. Or we're working with, or additionally, we're working with places like Singapore who produce, they only produce 10% of their food. That's their, that's their food security at the minute, the self-sufficiency, 10%. They want to get to 30% food security by 2030. Now, if you've ever been to Singapore or seen it on a map, it's tiny. So they can't grow that way. So they've got to grow that way. So vertical farming is perfect for them. And their diet is predominantly vegetable based. So producing things like um, lots of the other Asian vegetables, the pak choy, bok choy, 
we've tried them and they grow fantastically well and we can tailor them for that market. So for example, they tend to like the uh, pack choice and bok choice pale green. In the UK, we, we quite like them dark green, but by manipulating the lights, we can tailor it to the absolute market they want. They don't like it particularly spicy or peppery. We do in the UK, so we can dial the conditions back to, to tailor flavor to them as well. And what that means is a phenomenal reduction in waste in their system as well. So what does the vertical farm, and in this term, the advanced plant growth center, what's it going to deliver? Well, I told you about re-establishment of wild species. Because you've got the vertical farm, you have to think differently about how you would operate it. So if you're a vertical farm in Orkney, for example, I don't think it would be necessarily what you would call a true community one, but the community can use it. Think of that vertical farm. You've got lots of different trays. Think of it like a hotel or an Airbnb. So a business may want a restaurant, for example, because it's right, I want those herbs over a period of six months. So what you would do is rent out two or three trays and get your crop produced over that period. And again, it's just like an Airbnb or a hotel. You've rented space out in that to get your projects produced produce produced. Similarly, other companies may want stuff growing that would go into cosmetics or fragrances. Uh, they might want that at different times of the year or at the same time of the year. But again, you can do that all within the same vertical farming system because each one has its own microenvironment. And of course, you can grow just traditional foods. And what it allows you to do, as I said, is reduce waste, gives it unique tastes and textures. You, you, you can create a food authentic um, fresh produce to Orkney by creating a specific growth recipe. So you can create food authenticity for anything you grow specifically to where you grow it. And we can see you were talking about the integration with energy and the farming system. The new farming systems are all starting to look like this. So the diesel replacement, the hydrogen on farms, but the whole renewable energy piece is feeding into uh, the ability to produce new crops and new systems like a vertical farm here. So going forward, what would a vertical farm look like? And again, I'd be very specific in having farming, both types of farming. So if that's your vertical farm there, how would you power it? Well, you've got hydropower, you've got wind, it could be um, solar panels. And there's some interesting bits, certainly in the central belt of Scotland, we're chatting to people about putting cold water down the old coal mines and pulling water up at about 70, 80 degrees, and then using heat exchangers to create electricity that would then fuel the LED lights. Or there's some real wacky ideas about um, putting, lowering a weight, uh, pulling up a weight from a long well when energy is cheap and then when you let it go when energy is expensive and then harvesting that energy as the kinetic energy of a weight falling down. It sounds really crazy to me, but it's kind of getting tested on some, some ideas. Um, and so you've got lots of different ideas on how you would fuel it and actually, the, the policy agencies in the UK and Scottish government are looking very seriously about how they can implement that to increase food security. So in the Advanced Plant Growth Centre, you can see we're working on lots of different things, but we're talking about vertical farming here. So we can enhance the crops. We can create the recipes to develop really unique flavours, tastes, textures, aromas and offerings to consumers and retailers. Um, we can use them to produce new and old drugs. Um, we, can, we can really break the model of food supply chains at the minute through adopting renewable energy into that vertical farm. So you're not shipping produce thousands of miles, you're producing it where it's needed. And if you've got renewable energy where it's needed, you're on a winner. And if you do it at a scale, you can flip that model and start exporting out. So hopefully I've given you a feel for what vertical farming can offer. And I'm more than welcome now to answer some questions. Right, thank you very much indeed, Derek. I think that, um, so if you're on screen, if you can stick your thumb up and thank Derek for his uh, for his uh, for uh, So there's a question in the chat from Christine, Christine Edwards, who said, "A many many vertical." Uh, uh, vertical farming ventures have been going on for at least a decade. Are there any lessons learned? Um, yeah, there are. Um, don't go into it with your eyes closed and think you're going to make money immediately. I think that's probably the most obvious one, but that's business, I would say. Um, think about the market you want to supply. The vertical farming technology is 
Some of it's very mature. Some of it can be very basic. I can make your vertical farm for a few thousand pounds. Or you can go up to millions, depending on what you want to do. That's all predicated on the market. Now, so if you're putting one in on Orkney, say, you need to find out what the market's going to be. There's no point building something that's the size of three as the super source if the market's not there to take that. If there's something smaller and a very specific and niche market, or at least a smaller turnover market, I think you've probably got something that's be viable there that would use the restricted energy you've got. Um, I think you're on a winner having so much renewable energy that if you did put one in, you probably would become the model area for vertical farming and renewable energy globally. What you'd also operate well is, is that you're in a rural community that's kind of at the end of the supply chain. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you stuff that you know fully well. Um, and I'd like to hear back from you what you get in terms of fresh fruit and veg from your shops and what kind of shelf like it is. Because from the stuff in the vertical farm, as soon as it comes out there, we can probably give you two weeks plus shelf life for almost all of it, if not more. Um, is that what you get already from what's in the shops? Yeah, pro probably not. I would imagine most people would agree that it's probably fairly limited our shelf life and one of the, because everything has got a transport element on it. No. What you do. So you potentially, what you've got is you, you can open up the potential to change diets as well. Because you, you can only eat what you can see is made available to people. If you've suddenly got the potential to grow other stuff, through a slow press process of a, um, as we say, attrition, that's the wrong word, exposure to different stuff, as the generations change, or as, as the, younger, the younger kids often will try different stuff. Or if the dad's cooking and he's had a couple of fights, he'll cook anything, which usually happens with me. Um, it's exposure to all these different ingredients and potential produce you can do but the if you think of the vertical farm as a green factory that's a good way to think about it what can i produce in that green factory now, the other thing as well is if you've got problems with with the energy being uh, transmitted to the vertical farm if it stops the vertical farm just goes off plants can sit in the dark in fact they need some dark they're used to it if you're welding a car and the electricity goes off that's game over for that product so it's unusual to have a production system that doesn't mind if the electricity goes off like that. It can go off for half a day, it doesn't make any odds. In fact, in the larger vertical farm systems, they're seeing demand side response as a potential way to uh, generate income because they know they can sh switch off in microseconds if, if the, uh, the grid system demands it. So almost the vertical farm kind of becomes green battery-esque, like, if you, if you will. Um, Neil, you were asking how receptive are the markets of the produce? Um, Marks and Spencer's trial of vertical farm in their store, and it had lots of oohs and ahs from the people. Um, but actually, on a produce basis, most vertical farm companies are looking for parity in cost. But what they'll win at, win at is they can guarantee that if the buyer says, right, I want basil or lettuce or whatever it is, or um, cherry tomatoes, I want them of this quality. He knows that if he's getting it from that vertical farm, that quality will be the same this year as it is next, as it is next. And the variation in quality is that. Um, as I say, that's the biggest problem for retailers is quality variation. This has just shrunk that down to ridiculous levels. Um, now, there'll be winners and losers. So the glass house system people kind of, they've been pretty good quality, but the vertical farm takes that another level down. Um, but again, with the renewable energy, but if you're producing it, you've got a bigger margin of profit within that as well. Um, can you we 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 take somebody in the room here first and then come back oh. to, to Matthew or somebody else? Yeah. How, how mature are plant growth models in the sense that if you grow something, you test it, you tweak a variable, you grow it, you test it. That sounds like quite a slow process. Are there existing models of plants where you can go, I'll put in XYZ variable, I'll get this result. And then as a follow-up question to that is, how comprehensive are those variables, those models across different plants, different products, different crops? Uh, yes, there are. So essentially, um, there's kind of published databases, well, not databases, papers. And if you're working with the companies, they'll tell you anyway, they'll give you recipes that'll work for 
almost all the species they've tried. So I think to date we've gone through about 120 different species. So that's most of your food crops we've tried it on. So we've got ones that will generally fit the crop. Now, variety to variety, you'll get variation, but you can tweak that yourself. And in fact, um, I've yet to see anyone who doesn't want to play with the system and to see what they can do with it, whether it's tweaking it up in terms of taste, texture, uh, appearance. So an interesting one we did was um, somebody kind of balls up when they were growing basil and put the wrong lighting recipe in. They changed one wavelength, one set of bulbs for another, and they made basil uh, Genovese basil tastes like, you know that pink stuff you rinse your mouth out with and you go to the dentist? The basil tasted like that. Now, that was a disaster on a commercial produce bit, but what it highlighted was the sophistication is such that you can change radically tastes quite easily by manipulating the conditions. So it doesn't take you long to get to a point that exactly where you want to be. Um, it doesn't take that long because a lot of these crops, you can turn them around in, in what, four weeks, five weeks? So if you've got a few trays, each with different conditions, you will get to a best recipe almost within six weeks. Then, then you've got an optimum uh, product that you can then uh, put out for sale. Okay, did you have something from Matthew on the chat? Uh, right, so farming's a large employer, uh, part of the ecosystem. What would the impact on vertical farming be? Well, it's new skills. It's a new avenue for that. I mean, vertical farming is not an either or. I can't imagine you're going to be growing bare barley on a vertical farm. What you could do is breed the next generation of bare barley in a vertical farm. Because if you've got a controlled environment, what you can generally do, and we've done it for barley, we can put barley through four or five generations within a, a, a calendar year. So if you're crossing, and then putting those populations out into a vertical farm for next generations of new varieties, you can actually grow them under really stressful conditions that you see outside in Orkney and produce a better performing next generation variety of bare barley or something else that you want to grow. But I, th I would tend to see it integrated with existing agriculture. Um, one of the uses I've seen in Saskatchewan was somebody who was using a vertical farm to produce hyper intense protein crops to use for animal feed, particularly in the winter months when you can then use that as a supplement in the animal feed um, for the, the livestock. And that seemed to work extremely well. So again, you're really only limited by your imagination. For me, the vertical farming things, it's all about exposure to the agricultural community. This doesn't mean, oh Christ, that's my job gone. It's more a case of, oh, I want to use one of these. Every time we see a farmer and bring one into the vertical farms, the two questions at the end are, how much is it and when can I get one? Invariably. And we've had hundreds of farmers through the door to see this. Because what they see is a system that's going to produce product 24 7, 365. So you can have it blown a hoolie outside, but inside this, it'll still be producing produce. It could be a baking summer day outside. Well, maybe not so much up there in Scotland. We don't get baking summer days really. You can have a sunny day but you'll still be producing produce in this. It could be snowing, it could be hailing. This will still produce produce. So it becomes a banker for agriculture. Now, the way you would do it maybe as a cooperative, it might be not one individual farmer wants to do it, but as a cooperative, you may want to come together and, and, and develop one. And we're seeing the cooperative model starting to develop in different parts of Scotland for this. Martin, I think you've got a question. Yeah, I had two, but I'll, I'll leave one because somebody else has asked it later. But the, the one was, second one I had was, do you finish up with carbon dioxide deficiencies within the system because you're converting carbon dioxide into plant growth? No, because what you're doing in most of the systems is you, you, you will be pulling in, Fred. You've got an HVAC system that's pulling out, um, well, refreshing the air, essentially, but also because the plants are transpiring, they're evolving a lot of water, so you've got to control humidity. So by doing that, you've then got to pull in cold air from the outside. So depending on what system you use, people have got different systems of heating the air. Um, very often, you don't need to heat it because the heat generated by the LED lights is fine. So you put the cold air in and that cools things down. But the CO2, because you're bringing and refreshing the air, it's fine. Realistically, what you'd want to do is increase the CO2 because as I said, the plants love that. 
So if you're if you're putting it up, if you can access, if you're next to a distillery or a brewery, it's, or actually some factory that's got um, a vented system, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Chimney, that's the word. You can scrub the flue from the, the flue gases to take out the noxious ones, so you're only leaving CO2 and put that back into your vertical farm. And if you can double or treble the level of CO2, you'll increase the productivity and biomass of the crops. So lack of CO2 has never been a problem, Martin. Thank you. Um, Alistair, you say how critical is temperature in the vertical farm? And would this limit the variety of crops? That depends on the system you've got. So if you've got something like an intelligent growth solution one, they can create micro environments on each tree. Some of the other ones do that. The ones that are a bit more rudimentary and are essentially just like, for want of a better word, IKEA stack shelves with light underneath, you probably will have a system where you'll, you'll get a general temperature. Um, but you'd want an airflow in there so you don't get it cold at the bottom and roasting hot at the top. You want to at least create a, a certain flow in there that will allow a temperature to modulate out. So that that would tend to define what crops you'll grow. You probably want to set it at about 20, 22. For food crops, generally that's fine. You'll get really good productivity from them regardless. If you wanted to grow small trees, you'd need to put the temperature down. But what that probably means is you'll just circulate the air more often and pull in cold air. So it's, it's, it's an easy thing to control, but it does have an impact. Yeah, we've got a question from the room, or maybe a couple of questions from the room. Yeah. We'll take them next, David. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, distilleries and breweries. We've got more than our share of those. Um, so you talked about taking the CO2 from the distillery to the farm. But I wonder if there could be anything else going the other way in terms of botanicals and so forth. Absolutely. You've nailed that one quite easily, yes. Um, botanicals is an easy one to do because the, the crops for botanicals can be, frankly, a wee bit of a pain in the bum to grow. They're very delicate crops often, um, and they like to be cosseted. Well, the vertical farm is the ultimate in cosseting. Um, and so we've seen uh, a whole, we've grown a whole range of different botanicals that could potentially go into um, different types of vodkas, for example or different types of flavoured gins. And that's certainly an area where you could probably start creating authentic botanics for distilling from Orkney, but not necessarily use them just on Orkney. That could be a specific export product that can go worldwide. And I think the authenticity and place-based labelling you put on that could see that becoming quite an attractive product for shipping elsewhere. Right. Can I just ask, uh, do, do you not feel that uh, with vertical farming there is a danger that we end up as a factory farm that everything starts tasting the same? If you see where you're going through to the end and say, oh, well, people want that taste. But the, the, the beauty of buying different vegetables from different places at the moment, in my head anyway, is you get good ones from here and, and, and better ones from somewhere else or whatever. Absolutely. So Absolutely. there is that danger that we head to that unification. I completely agree that I think the element of choice has to remain. Um, I think the, the the more bulk produce ones is they're looking for everything's based on margins. Uh, and again, going back to that, that variation in taste you're talking about is not something that necessarily big retail wants. Um, but you could you could, going back to what I'm saying, you can dial in a perfect flavor by controlling it yourself. So you, you can almost take an approach, I'm just thinking about BrewDog, where they create um, branded time-limited variations of products. So you might want to create a Christmas produce. You may want to create an Easter produce, a summer solstice crop, and each of them will have different flavours. Yeah. You can actually, that's all within the wherewithal of the system to create that. Um, and you can create that variation then. Or actually, depending on your off-taker, as your off-taker may be, I don't know, the shipping cruise companies that come in and may want to take that produce on board, they may, they may want to define themselves, right, we want something that tastes like X, Y, and Z, is this crunchy, right, you can dial all that in and produce that for them. So they want, they may not want variation, but for on island and different consumers, you can also do that. What you can do is dedicate different parts of the vertical farm often just to do that bit so you can create your bulk product, a 
and small minor products as well. So the ability to do that is within your grasp should you want to do that. Yeah, I, agree. I think Jane was had a question, Jane Rawl. Yeah, hi, thanks, Derek. I found this very informative. Oh, you've gone on mute, Jane. We've got a mute, Jane, we can. Yeah. Perfect, sorry about that. Um, I've found this very fascinating. Thank you, Derek. Um, just wanted to ask, I currently work for the Orkney Woodland Project and part of my role is to collect seed for native trees and they are posted off, sent to a nursery south who propagate and then I draw on that stock to bring back for uh, tree planting projects that are that have gained grant um, yeah. approval. It always has grated on me at how what the carbon footprint of that is. Um, and so ideally this would be perfect. Yeah, Takes I, space, space. And, I mean, I'm just very interested with the Scottish grower who is growing it on a more of a commercial scale. Um, I don't know if you can share those sorts of contacts. And That's a commercial and confidence one at the minute. But what to do is if you give me a shout, Jane, through, give me an email. <laughs> um, I can put you in contact with a vertical farm company that's doing that. And they probably would be able to share some pictures just to show how spectacular it is. Um, and actually, I, yeah, I mean, if, if something goes up to Orkney, you're not going to need the whole thing to do that. Again, it's going back to what I was saying earlier, that you can dedicate small aspects to different things. So you yeah. may want to do that off season during the quiet time when produce is maybe <coughs> too much, but then that'll allow you to turn around those plants. You can maybe even get them to the point where you can get them to turn over to find the semi mature ones that are very low and then force them to seed flower, flower and seed as well. So you can start to bulk seed produce within these. Systems. Yeah, I, yeah, we, I if you want there's, there's a purity element that we kind of yeah. want to. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but again, the, the, the systems, the system is, is so malleable, it allows you to do many things with it. But if it's simple, just things, taking the seed, growing them up, easy. It's been shown. Yeah, I think very, very I think the hardening off is going to be the one that's the challenge. Um, uh, you know, not wanting to take the plants more than about 20 centimetres, putting them out and hardening them off at that stage. So that's what I'd be very interested in doing it from a very young tree getting it out and hardening it off so what early. we did is we we were involved as well as we took the plants from the vertical farm and put them into what's called the tie gun so it's like a polytunnel but it's just a netted polytunnel um and they were fine so that that yeah. that short hardening up was fine and then they went out to um get put in we actually had the same kind of thing for um different crop completely it was um broccoli so in the broccoli people they import a lot of plantlet uh, and then they put them into cold storage for a long time, then they plant them out. Cold storage costs a lot of money, it's a lot of energy. So with the company, we produced broccoli, small plantlets in the vertical farm, hardened them off in the vertical farm, and then put them out, and they got the best production yield they've ever had. And then when they calculated the cost across the process, it was, the saving was phenomenal. So a lot of it's proof of concept and showing people, yeah, it can't be that good, nothing's that good. N nothing ever seems to be as, as good as it seems. Seems to be so far the vertical farming piece, at least in productivity terms, has been spectacularly successful. Yeah, it, it, to me it seems like hydroponics with light. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm. that's it. I mean, you can and grow layers. them. So we've got different systems we would grow them in, whether it's um, um, film technology, whether it's hydroponics, whether it's deep water systems. Sometimes we're still growing them in artificial, uh, real or artificial media as well. It's just it's horses for courses. And what, often the familiarity of growing stuff in soil, you may want to put coir in there and grow them in that mm. instead. Mm. And then you could play with moving them into hydroponics if you want. Perfect, thank you. There's a few other questions on the chat there. Uh, <coughs> uh, right, Neil, so you're asking about the inputs. Uh, pesticides, nope. Um, can this be, uh, what are the nutrients? Um, I think at the minute they're using just standard fertilizer mix, but the amount you use compared to glass and field is phenomenally less. Uh, what they're then looking for is in systems where you're harvesting a bit of the plant and you've got stuff left. Say, for example, basil, you take the, and you're just cropping it 
ground level. There's still a lot of root systems in there. I was chatting today with other companies about developing small digestion systems to digest all, all, all the plant material to create nutrient. So it's re nutrient recycling that we can do that. Um, theoretically, you can start to use manures, but you're gonna to have to clean them up. My worry with that is the transmission of, um, not so much uh, bacteria, but viruses from animal systems going in. Um, even the best sterilization processes won't get rid of viruses. So I'd be loath to go down that route. But green, green manures um, from our compost-based systems where you digest them down, recovering nutrients for that was really efficient. Um, so the other one well is, can seaweed provide the bulk of nutrients? Um, interestingly, we tried that not for vertical farming, but for field crops. That worked spectacularly well. So, so I see no reason that it won't work there. The problem you've got is because the system is so good at feeding nutrients, you have to watch about the level of iodine you're putting in because the plants will just suck it up. And then you've got, regardless of how well you've designed that plant, all you're going to taste is the iodine in there. Um, but there are types of other types of seaweed that are not iodine rich as well. So yeah, that's, that's a really effective way of doing it. Again, just digest it down to a liquid uh, nitrate and uh, liquid nutrient solution and you're fine. Okay. okay, any more for any more? Any other questions in the room here or any questions? Yeah. Just tell me how, how does it generally scale? How do generally costs scale with increasing um, size? Oh, it's just a million dollar question and sometimes it is a million dollars. Uh, it depends what you want to do. Uh, so one guy I'm working with in the west coast of Scotland um, near uh, Loch U, he's got a brewery and old farm sheds. So he wants to use the CO2 and heat from the brewery. And he's going to convert one of his old farm sheds into a vertical farm. He's going to be about 10K, um, but he knows he's going to just supply restaurants within almost within a seven mile radius. You can go the other way and go hyper tech that will allow you to do many different things. And that could take you into the hundreds of thousands. Again, it, uh, once you're up to the hundreds of thousands ones, they're basically plug and play modules. You just you just add more and more and more and more and more. Um, again, it depends on what you're supplying to, what you want to grow, and what you think your market is. Um, I mean, if you've got a glass house and you've got shelves in it, you can put LED lights underneath and you've got a vertical farm there already. So that, it could be as cheap as that. You've got Danish shelves, kind of. So if you took out the little bits of this, LED lights under there, that could be a mini vertical farm. As you can put a glass panel down in front of that and occasionally go in and feed and water it. That's your, that's your most primitive vertical farm. So it's as, it's as complex as you want it to be, depending on what you want to grow and what you want to do with that produce. And we are there to help. Excellent. Ellen? I wanted to ask, surely the market will prevail are the, uh, are the glass house growers taking this on board and beginning to see it as a replacement for the old volume? Uh, so if I was hearing it right, are the glass house companies seeing this as an alternative or something they may want to evolve into? Uh, yes. Uh, glass isn't the most sustainable thing in the world. So if they're, and interestingly, when a lot of these companies are wanting to get investment to tool up, or get more capital. Increasingly now, investors are looking at the environmental footprint of what they're investing in. Um, and so glass is never a great answer to that. I think what will happen is you've already got a lot of early adopters for vertical farming across the UK. There's a great one in Ellen um, that's been set up by a company called Vertigrow, which I think are supported through Brewdog, as I remember. Uh, they've taken an intelligent growth solution system and put it there. I was chatting to Graham Warren, who's running this system. Apparently is running gung ho. I'm going to go up and see it, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, but what, what it does is it creates interest in a huge radius all around. So if you've got glass, you're in there sniffing around thinking, well, what, what, what can it do that I can't? And it, what it turns out to be is you can produce produce 24 7, 365. And because they're designed now, they designed a bespoke system and a new building, 
they've, they've put it up to be fueled by renewable energy as well. So suddenly his running costs, or comparative costs for produce are way down. So I think you'll see an evolution of systems going forward. And again, you'll see the systems maybe move away from where they are. So you might see a lot of vertical farms in areas where you've got wind farms. They could, interestingly, you might see them proliferate across the old coal mining communities because putting cold water down and bringing hot water up and then converting that to electricity is a way of, that, that's a quote, never ending energy supply. Obviously you've got to pay the coal authority, but if that energy ever runs out, I think growing fresh produce is going to be the least of our problems. It means the center of the earth's gone cold and we're all going to die. Um, so I think we'll see an evolution of the systems as we go forward. And I think it's quite exciting. So the systems I see at the moment will be very different to what my son, when he's my age, will see, or when his kids grow up to his age. I think you'll see a completely different landscape there. Um, what it then means is, I, I'm kind of thinking about, if you look at Scotland and that proliferation of wind energy all across Scotland, the potential to supply renewable energy to a lot of this produce in Scotland, can Scotland potentially become a huge producer for Europe? Maybe. Nice thought. Maybe a good thought to finish on, unless there's any particular I would like everybody to give uh, uh, Derek another round of applause. That's been a really enthusiastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Derek. And, and provided we'll, we'll have the, if it's okay with you, once your you, you, uh, presentation, we'll put it up on our ref. Uh, no problem. And, and point point people to it and, and thank you for the offer of, of if there's other questions to, to, to use your email address. So thank you very much. And Absolutely. maybe once, once we have a vertical farm in Orkney, which I, I think is part of our Island Steel project, yeah. maybe we'll see you in Orkney. Oh, oh absolutely. Probably yeah. before it's built, to be honest. I think we need to come up and discuss it more sensibly, particularly with something like Neil talking about where, where's the energy going to come from? That's the number one question. Uh, well, that, that, we, should, we, should, we should take that away and we'll find a way to, to get you some energy and uh, you get the vertical farm and we're in a deal, yeah? Well, uh, I'll help you get the help. I'll help you get the vertical farm. Ah, that's what I'm saying. You get the vertical farm and we'll get the energy, yeah? Okay, well, glad I can help. And as I said, the email's there, so please use it. We're, right. we're more than happy to help. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.